intend to stand as close to the front of the stage as possible so that the presenter on the screen doesn't catch my face. Let me just do a quick test. It's on my face, isn't it? And um, Buffer Fest. So, super excited to be here. I've wanted to come to Buffer Fest for a really long time because I think Buffer uh, uniquely celebrates the aspect of being a YouTuber, being a creator um, that I am most attracted to, which is actually making the videos. Less of the Hey Guys stuff, more about actual creating content that's meaningful to the creator as well as the audience. So, with that, I'm, I'm tremendously excited to be here. Just to give a little structure, I've got like, they told me I couldn't make this talk any longer than two and a half hours, so I'm gonna try to get past. <laughs> Just kidding, it's gonna be quick, but um, since Buffer Fest is all about premieres, I wanna, I'm gonna end my talk by showing, it's like a two minute video. It's not quite done, but it's sort of a continuation of that, but it, it felt appropriate to share here because this short video that, that I'm gonna, this rough version that I'm gonna show you is essentially a celebration of, of being a creator, um, similarly to do what you can. But with that, I want to take this time, I want to take this, this, this opportunity in front of all of you to show some of my older movies that carry you through my career up until now. Um, they're all short, it's a YouTube, they're like two minute movies. But show me those movies, it's tell some of the stories around those movies and, and the impact they had on me as a creator, which ultimately led to me abandoning my roots as like a formal filmmaker and TV guy and really fully embracing with every aspect of my career and creativity and every, all my energy, just embracing what it means to be a, an online video maker. I wish the word YouTuber wasn't so fucking good, you know? If it's not YouTuber, what is it? Online video creator? It's stupid. <laughs> YouTuber. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I'm gonna, this whole talk's gonna be one story, and then the video that I'm gonna end with is, is hopefully a compartmentalization of that story in two minutes. But with that, you know, when I, I'm 36 now, so when I first got really excited about making movies, I was obsessed with like, you know, the, the Tim Burton's and the Martin Scorsese of the, Martin Scorsese's of the world. That was, to me, that's all I knew filmmaking to be. I watched these movies like, you guys remember the first time you saw Goodfellas and it just blew your mind? And I was like, if that can be a job, if that can be a career, that is all I want. And then when I was introduced to like the Spike Jones and the Michelle Gondries of the world, I started to understand what independent cinema was as a teenager. Uh, it felt a little bit more like, okay, maybe that's a target I can reach for because I don't think I'll be Spielberg anytime soon. And, and that's what I embraced, that's what I chased after. And when I got my first computer, um, you guys are also like, yo, there's some old people out there. Do you guys remember that like bulbous iMac that was like colorful and then the commercial was like stir? There's a hand back there. Okay, that was it. Like, and we could get technical. The hard drive on that machine was 10 gigs. <laughs> so what that meant is like, I literally, I would edit a video until it was out of space, and then I would export that video to tape wipe my whole hard drive, delete the entire edit file, and then start editing the second half, and then line up the tape by like, play, pause, play, pause, play, pause, and then export right there. So if you're watching the video, and then you're like, dude, and it would start playing again. And like, that was making videos. I started making videos. That's all I knew. And I, I fell in love with the process, and even then, you know, first few years as a filmmaker, I was still obsessed with this idea, this, this what it meant to be a big filmmaker. I saw this as sort of a, a way of getting my foot in the door. NYU Film School, any sort of formal avenues were so out of reach for me. Um, the only place that I felt like I could have a little bit, a little taste of what it meant to be a creator, what it meant to be a filmmaker, was by making these little videos on my 10 gigabyte hard drive. Um, with that, the enthusiasm, the passion, that that sort of was born in me from doing that was real. And it was like, it was like when you're totally obsessed with something. It was like when you meet that girlfriend or that boyfriend and like the first six weeks of being madly in love, you know that like it's all you think about? 
That's what it was like for me from the moment I started making videos. And it still hasn't faded much. It's still that level of, of passion. And it, and it led me to New York City. And when I got to New York City, I was still making movies and I was hustling. I was doing anything I could. And then in, in 2003, um, my iPod battery died. Speaking to the old people in the room again, do you remember the first gen iPod were like, when you turned it on as a physical battery? Like, <laughs> All right, I was like dead broke. I made ten dollars an hour then. It was three hundred fifty bucks or four hundred bucks to get that thing. And when the battery died, I was really pissed off because it's, it's bullshit. Man, just fix the battery for me, and they wouldn't fix it. So I made a movie about that. Apple's official for a new iPod, right? They have a video camera. So I run around New York City and I spray painted like they have, you know, like when you see a cigarette advertisement, like the bottom third is like, this will give you cancer. So I went and my brother Van and I. We put one of those monikers on every single iPod poster that was in New York City. And this is when they had like that, that like colorful campaign that people were dancing in the earbuds, you know? Like they were everywhere. And they were really sparse. There was no text on them. So our bold white text at the bottom that said, Apple's unreplaceable battery lasts only 18 months, really stood out. And we made a movie. It was 2003, we put the movie online. This is like two and a half, three years before uh, um, YouTube, so you just put it up on a splash page. And that video, like, they crashed every We used a web hosting site. I had like a $5.99 month deal for like five gigs up and two gigs down or some, something like that. I was like, never going to get through that. <laughs> and if it went over, they would just bill me for it. And the CEO of the company called my cell phone. And he introduced himself as the CEO of the company like 36 hours after I posted the video. And this isn't YouTube, so there's like no view count. I have no idea what's going on. I was like, oh, maybe people like it. <laughs> and he calls me and he's like, hey, you're crashing all of our servers. You're way past your allowance. You're... <laughs> I was like, it's like 10 bucks an hour, okay. And, and I just told, I remember telling him, I was like, don't take it down, don't take it down. So we went back to the splash page and we put up a thing at the bottom. I was like, I need help hosting this. So some kids got in touch with me from a college, university, they put it up on their university server, it crashed that. Eventually I had like this nerd who reached out to me, this tech geek who's really, really good. And he had it mirrored everywhere, like across a number of campuses, and it was good for like three hours. And then every campus started complaining. And the irony of this whole story is that um, back in the day, Apple had something called, I think it was called iDisc, and it was like, you could upload little videos and then share them with your family and stuff, but they had no, um, no limits on bandwidth. So, <laughs> you see where the joke's going. So for $9.99 a month, they hosted terabyte after terabyte of bandwidth for a video that was tearing their policy to pieces. Um, thanks, Apple. Long story long. The, I meant for that one to be a quick one. The takeaway from that was like, I was, I had something I needed to get off my chest, something I needed to share. And as a teenager who had like a, a rough childhood and I had never felt listened to, uh, this was a way of me expressing myself and everyone heard it. And it happened to be an idea that I think we're all frustrated with, like whether your iPod broke or you just want to return your cable box or some, some higher power is sort of screwing you over as a little man. Um, there was something universal about this. And I, I think, I didn't notice this then because I was 22 and 22 year olds are all idiots. And now as a smart, brilliant, wise, sage old 36 year old, I'm able to look back and say, like, I think what that was, what, why that was such a big moment for me is it wasn't about the craft of filmmaking. It wasn't the Scorsese or the Kubrick or the Spielberg of it. It was me being pissed off, having something I needed to say grabbing whatever tools I had at my disposal, which were a can of spray paint and a, a DV camera, and going out and making something. And that something, that manifestation, was a short video. And that, that is a, that's a really big idea right there, because what that is, is that means filmmaking is not a, for me, not a craft, but filmmaking is sort of a, a, a that was pivotal. Um, in sort of this formation, this thesis that I'm explaining to you. So, you know, I, I found success after iPod 30 Secret, and, and you know, there was a, it was a bumpy road. There was a lot of interesting things done, a lot of failures, a lot of really big ups and big downs in a career as a struggling creator pre-YouTube. 
there's no ad sense that to make money it really require other being out there and hustling and doing stupid stuff that you never want to do. Um, like I hope I can give the rest of my life without ever having to make another bar mitzvah video. <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> but like when you do like the dance sequence of 13 year old boys like 10, 10 times, really, you just can't do it anymore. It's just not interesting. Um, but with that, there are a lot of ups and downs. And, and the biggest, uh, the biggest crowd achievement of my career was making this, this show, the one of the show, and then we sold it to, to HBO for a couple million dollars, this huge success. And, they sat on it for two years and it came out two years later and nobody saw it. And it was like, it was like a big, it's like the biggest firework you could buy. You launch it in the air and it gets to the top, which is like, pew, and nothing. And that's what it felt like. And after that, I wasn't sure what to do. And that's when I turned to YouTube. That's when I decided that like, fuck it, it wasn't the politics that I'm interested in. It's not the crap that I'm interested in. I don't care about the glamour, I don't care about the limousine, I don't care about the celebrity of it. I just actually want to make things. I want to share ideas and share perspectives. And that was when I started a YouTube channel, it was like 2010. And I remember there was this one time in 2010 wherein I, my HBO show was still premiering. There were still new episodes coming out every week when I started my YouTube channel. And I had less subscribers on my YouTube channel than my 12-year-old son's friends had on their YouTube channels. <laughs> and I was on HBO, I was like a big deal. At least I thought it was a big deal. And that really made me fall in love with YouTube for its accessibility. But with that, I, I, I made a movie. This was the first hit of my YouTube channel. And this is a really, really, really stupid movie um, that I'm gonna show you soon. A very stupid movie. But this movie for me was sort of an extension of what I learned, that experience from making that iPod video. Seven years later I made this video, and again, this is not exactly cinematic gold. This is something that was shot on a hundred dollar camera from Walmart. I remember you couldn't hear me, so what I did was I plugged a little lavalier microphone into my cell phone and hit record on my cell phone, just had it rolling all day. But we never clapped, so I had to figure out how to line up the audio later. <laughs> this is, that's a terrible process, by the way. Um, but this video I learned a lot from. So I want you guys to know BufferFest is super pro and they needed all my videos months ago so they could have them teed up in this presentation perfect. And when I gave them to them 15 minutes ago, <laughs> um, they were like, we're worried it's not gonna be smooth. And I was like, I, you have my full confidence, gentlemen. So I wrote down on the back of my left hand here the order in which to instruct them to play the videos. So with that, we're gonna to go to number two. That is video with the title, the number two, not necessarily the second, not necessarily the second one. We're getting thumbs up all around here. Okay. The same day. It exploded, a like crazy viral, I remember the, Mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, had to respond to that movie in a press conference two days after it came out. Could you imagine? This is a guy, Michael Bloomberg, billionaire, built from the ground up, runs for mayor. He's like a pillar of the universe, and he has to respond to that movie. <laughs> so embarrassing. Um, but that movie was, again, that movie was in its most purest form just an expression of my own frustration. It was a way of me, there was something in my head, I felt like I'd been unjustly gotten, given a ticket. How do I express that frustration? I couldn't bitch about it to my girlfriend anymore because she stopped caring. It's a complicated story to tell. How do I share that in a way that people might care about? So I made that silly video and it exploded. It really, really, really exploded. It went huge. And the thing that struck me the most, the aspect of that, that video that, that had the biggest impact on my career. As I had a call a couple weeks after that came out from the New York Times. Um, it, that's a, like a small newspaper, it's out of the um, news. <laughs> and they were like, we're launching a video series called Op Dots, like opinion documentaries, and your video would be perfect for that. Um, and at first I was like, wait, you're sure you're calling the right guy? I'm the one who crashed the bike into a cop car. And they were like, yes. And that and what they liked was the fact that it was sort of a complicated issue. Like, how do you explain the nuances of, of being ticketed in a way that you shouldn't have been ticketed for something that shouldn't be that way? And, and that video did all that. Can you do that for us, the New York Times? And the answer was yes. And together we made a, a bunch of films over the years that I worked at the time, and they were really successful and 
It was a wonderful relationship. It legitimized me as a content creator. Um, there's one anecdote of that relationship that I'd like to share, though, which is that uh, they, as that program got bigger and bigger, they brought out a junior editor, a very talented girl um, named Lindsay. And the first time she and I ever spoke on the phone, I was like, Lindsay, New York Times, congratulations. How'd you get this job? And she was like, well, I was an undergrad at Harvard where I, I majored in journalism. After that, I worked at this publication, this news outlet, this news outlet. And ultimately, they were impressed with my application and a series of, of articles that I won awards for. And I was like, wow, that's huge. She was like, how'd you get this job? I was like, I crashed my life into a dot com. Again, the same kind of thing. It wasn't about the craft of filmmaking. It wasn't about the red carpets. It wasn't about getting into the right film festival. It wasn't about <laughs> that thing, that maxim, that, that adage that I'll never understand. It's not, who, it's not what you know, it's who you know. What the fuck does that even mean? A movie like that had nothing to do with any of those politics. I was understood to represent what it meant to be a filmmaker. It was just me expressing myself. And again, that is what I really, really fell in love with. It became a platform for me to make videos and I post about once a month. Um, they get different reactions, some big audiences, some small audiences, but there's always appreciate, an appreciation for them. Uh, all the while, I was making a living directing TV commercials because my, my YouTube channel was not monetized for the first 200 million views. I should have clicked that box sooner. <laughs> um, but that wasn't how I made money. And for then, or then it was an integrity issue for me. It was like, I was too concerned, little did I know how right I was, but I was too concerned that if I monetized my YouTube channel, that I would just be chasing views instead of making content that was important to me. Um, that's why I didn't do it. So I made a living by directing TV commercials. Now, I don't know if, if any of you have been exposed to directing TV commercials, or if they're still directed this way, but this is how it worked for me for like, for all of the early 2000s. I would get like a, 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 a the brand would go to an agency which would go to my agent. The agent would come to me with the brand's idea. I would go back to my agent with my idea for how I, ex how I would execute the brand's idea. They would take that idea that was my idea on how to execute the brand's idea, they'd bring it back to the agency, which would bring it back to the brand. Then the brand would say, okay, brand would go back to the agency, agency would go back to my agent, agent would come to me. This would happen like 55 times. And then finally you'd be awarded the job. And then you would show up on set, and I would have a storyboard that is literally photos, hand-drawn pictures of what this shot should look like exactly. And then I'd have a DP who would set the camera up to look exactly like the shot that they drew. And then there'd be staffs and crews, and I remember they'd have, literally they had a camera going through my camera so they could see what it was pointing at at all times. And that was maybe the most soulless work I'd ever done in my entire life. I li literally a robot could do it. I never understood they paid a shitload, so I did that. Um, and if you want to know what kind of work I did, one commercial I did was for Atkins Low Carb Candy Bars. Great, they started a couple <laughs> cases, I had like six of those things. Then I noticed on the label it said do not eat more than one a day or it may cause severe. It was a rough afternoon. <laughs> but that was how I made a living. And after the success of bike lanes, and after my YouTube channel started to get an audience, these brands, instead of going through that big pitching process, they would try to get to me directly, and they'd be like, we love your YouTube videos. Here's our script, here's our script. And eventually, I went back to my agent, and I was like, do you just cut out all the fat here? I was like, I have a YouTube channel, and look at my videos if they want to know what I'm gonna do for them. Just find companies that are willing to work with me and enabled me to make videos that would be mutually beneficial. And I remember, I'll never forget, her condescending, she's a lovely woman, I don't need to shit on her, but in her condescending New Zealand accent, her saying to me, oh, sweetheart, it doesn't work like that. Um, God, revenge is so bittersweet, isn't it? <laughs> so I immediately stopped working with them, and this was my pursuit. I was like, I need to be louder on YouTube, and I will find brands to work with. I'll be able to turn this into a living, and ultimately a company. And again, I worked with some smaller brands. Ultimately, I got an opportunity with Nike. Um, Nike is a small shoe manufacturer out of Beaverton, Oregon. <laughs> and the deal with them was to make three videos um, about their, uh, like their Fitbit tracker. And it was really exciting. 
The first video was like a very traditional 30 second spot to get people pumped up. It was great. We shot it, like we took um, Sharpies and graffiti and, and spray paint rather and made graffiti and did all these amazing like, all this amazing text all over New York City and that's what we used to sort of narrate the video was this text. Um, when they asked if we had permits, we said yes. <laughs> They loved it. They were really excited about it. It required me working with three of their top athletes, which was really cool. Like major, major athletes. Um, one such athlete that we worked with, huge footballer, and we weren't sure what to do with it. We were walking around Los Angeles trying to figure out like, what's a fun idea for us. We went into like a high school, um, like a local high school, and the kids there freaked out when they saw them. We got all this great footage. But it turns out the high school, like, they wouldn't let us use their footage. There's for whatever reason. And then I got a call from Nike that was like, you're good to use their footage. I found out later that Nike bought their football field a new scoreboard. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they signed the release. <laughs> awesome. Everybody wins. Yeah. <laughs> and then it came time to make the third video. Um, and now this is like four months into the relationship, a wonderful relationship. I had this kooky idea. Um, <laughs> And when I sort of tried to explain them what the idea would look like, they were like, I have no idea what you're talking about, Casey. Why don't we just stick to the script? And I was like, you, you got it, boss. And then I decided I didn't want to do that. But I wanted to pursue my idea. I wanted to sort of abandon the script and chase down something that I thought I could make truly great. So something that there was real passion behind. Um, and the idea, Make It Count is the movie, but the idea behind Make It Count was, what would happen, this is my fantasy, what would happen if we just went to an airport and bought a ticket on the next flight out of town. And then wherever that town would be, it's sick of that town, just buy a ticket, and then wherever the next flight out of that town. We just kept going until we ran out of money. What would happen? And that sounded like such an interesting idea. And when I called my editor and I was like, hey, wanna go on this trip with me? He was like, what about the Nike commercial? And I was like, eh, you know, they gave us the whole budget ahead of time, so we're probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, I'm not sure what this means for our video, but Let's do it. So we did it, and we went out and ran around the world. It was the most exciting adventure of my entire life. And when we came back from that trip, we had, it was well over 40 hours of content, <coughs> which is a lot of content when you're trying to make like a two-minute video. And we wrestled, and we wrestled, and we wrestled. And I remember we missed our first deadline, and then we missed our second deadline. And then we were supposed to premiere at South by Southwest, and we didn't show up. And then I remember Alex Lopez, the um, executive from Nike, showed up to my office, kind of unannounced, which is a big deal when you understand that his office is in Oregon and mine's in New York City. <laughs> and I remember, like, I can picture it right now. He's a cool guy, um, great guy. He's the one who greenlit this whole thing. Him standing behind us and him just being like, show me anything. Us showing him some of our assemblies and, and you know that look when your parents aren't mad at you, they're just disappointed? <laughs> that was the look. And I remember them in there being like, ah, like, this is such an opportunity. This is Nike. This is like the, the crown jewel. This is it. And we kind of screwed the pooch here by like rolling the dice. I don't know what the gambling metaphor is, but like we bet on one on one number and spun the wheel. And we hadn't figured it out yet. And eventually he left and let us, let us do our thing. We finished the movie. We were excited about it. We didn't know if it was good, especially after that process. And we sent it to Nike and Nike. I remember they were just like, Alex was like, Casey, I don't know what this is, but I think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and what he meant by that is that he didn't necessarily think it was good. He thinks that it might be good. Does that make sense? Do you understand that distinction there? He wasn't saying, I think it's good. He was saying, I, I think this might actually be good. But he wasn't sure. He was like, why don't you just go ahead and put it on your YouTube channel and let's see what happens. And that video exploded. It was huge. It was the most watched video that he had ever put out. I remember for me, the peak of the success around that movie was when Mark Parker, the CEO of Nike, called me. He was like, I saw that playing in somebody's, on somebody's monitor in the office, so I went and watched the whole thing, and I realized I've got to get out more. This is the CEO of Nike! <laughs> and, there was a lot that I learned from that. There was a lot that I took away from that um, about taking risk, about chasing down your passion, about. <laughs>
was that jump into that um, that sinkhole, which if you ever find yourself in the middle of the desert in Oman in the Middle East and you find a gigantic sinkhole, don't jump in. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. But I remember like if you watch that shot, there's a, a shadow line cutting through the middle of the frame and the sun was setting, which meant like we had about ten minutes of light where you could actually see me. And we set up the cameras at the bottom and like climb out nothing but like my running shorts. And I'm up at the top of that thing standing up there like this weirdo westerner Jew in the middle of the Middle East, standing at the top with no clothes on, at the top of this sinkhole like this. So I'm like looking over there and like, Max, I don't think this is safe for humans. <laughs> and this this guy with his with his herd of, of goats in like the traditional, I don't know what it's called, the traditional outfit that, that they wear, and he had like a bright dyed red beard, comes over and he's like 20 feet away from me and he's staring at me. And I look back at him and I go like this. <laughs> and he goes like this, he goes like this, he goes. <laughs> and when he said that, I was like, oh, uh -huh, oh. And I jumped away from the edge, and it's like, what are you trying to tell me, wise old wizard? <laughs> and, and I look at him, and I was like, what? And he goes like this, he goes. So I was like, oh, okay. And I literally go like this. And then he goes. trying to warn me about. <laughs> so what I learned from that video, I learned a lot from that video, but after that video I called from all kinds of companies. The opportunities that came my way were huge and they were wonderful. And almost without exception, the, the amount of freedom and creative latitude that brands were willing to give me after seeing that video was huge. And my relationship with how I made a living as a creator changed completely. And I developed this sort of thesis of, of what brands I would work with based on this thesis. And this thesis goes like this. I call it the golden rule. It has to benefit me, me the creator, as much as it benefits you the brand for us to work together or we don't work together. And what that means is like that video was really big for Nike. That thing did 20 million views and make it count was all about what that, that light up bracelet stood for. It was about getting off your ass and getting out there and doing things. It was great for Nike, it was great for me, it was the video that I wanted to make. So here's this golden rule, could, uh, could I work with companies and adhere to this thesis? And I can tell you five years later, there have been misses. I've worked with companies like, what the hell was I thinking? And I've worked with companies that have been incredibly fruitful. Um, and that's why like, Samsung was one of the sponsors of this event. That's why I love working. Did you pay by Samsung for that? <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I have such enthusiasm for working with that company and why I've got nothing but a big fat fuck you to all the haters about it. Because, look, they make good products, but like, you know, I think their competitors make good products. So I think Nike makes good sneakers. So I think their competitors make good sneakers. What is it about a brand that we identify with? And what Samsung is willing to do and what they've proven time and time again with not just me but myriad other creators is that they want to support the creator community. They want to sponsor events like Buffer. They want to work with creators the way they do. They want to enable creators, not just with their hard work, but with their dollars, with their messaging, and everything they do. And that's something that I can get behind. So Apple fanboys want to call